Welcome back, bitch. You the bitch. No, you the bitch. No, you. No, you. No, you. No. I'll fuck you. Oh, my I God. Said you the bitch. No, you. No, you. No, you. Man. That's yeah, right. Walk away, bitch. You thought I had left, huh? You a bitch, bro. Welcome back <clears throat> to another reaction video. And today we're going to be reacting to I Spent a Day with Coma Survivors. Uh, this is by Anthony Pad Padilla. I've, I've seen some of his uh, videos. They're really dope. I liked his uh, spending. I spent a day with uh, uh, people with Tourette syndrome. I think that's what it's called. And also the, the one with multiple personalities. Yeah, that shit was dope. So we're going to watch this one. I know this is a long video. I don't care. <laughs> so we're just going to jump right into it. It's 25 minutes. So if y'all could bear with me, I love you. <laughs> Let's just hop right into it. I'm recording. Yep. Coma, a state of prolonged, deep unconsciousness commonly caused by severe injury or illness. Coma is a medical emergency. Did, did y'all hear about that one dude that got hit in the head? Like he, he got, like he got jumped or something like that. And like he went into a coma when he woke up, he became a, ge a genius. Like the, they call him the accidental genius or something like that. It was really dope. swift medical attention to preserve life and brain function. The term coma is derived from the Greek word meaning deep sleep and was first oh. mentioned in medical records dating back to the 17th century when patients would commonly undergo bloodletting in which leeches were commonly used to drain blood from a patient. But thankfully, medical technologies have advanced and coma patients are now sustained through the use of intubation, ventilation, and administration of fluids or blood. My name's Anthony Padilla, and today I'm gonna be sitting down with coma survivors to learn what this traumatic experience is really like. Did the coma these survivors endured provide them with a surreal, out-of-body experience that forever altered their faith in life beyond perceived reality? Or did it simply feel like an unpleasant, never-ending nap? Has the recovery from their coma gone completely without a hitch? Or has it been a constant, disheartening struggle to move beyond this life-shattering incident? I mean, I would assume it to be a freaking life-changing experience, bro. Like, there's no way you wake up to from a coma and then just go back to your normal life. Like, you're going to have to... No, Hello, things change Julia. in your life. Hello, how are you? Frank. Hey. Eben. Anthony, how are you? Thank you so much for coming on here and teaching me about the world of surviving a coma. Well, thanks for having me on. It's a joy to be here. What do you consider yourself? A coma survivor? Uh, someone with a new perspective on life? A coma survivor. A kid who got a second shot more than anything. I would say I've just been blessed with an extraordinary experience that helps me come to a deeper understanding of you know, what this universe is all about and uh, what, what I am all about. The incident. Can you recall the events that led up to the coma? There was no real um, kind of warning that this was happening. A few sniffles or something, you know, the day before. And then at 4.30 in the morning, November 10th, 2008, I woke up with severe back pain, just terrific. Worked my way down the hall into a, a hot bathtub thinking that would help. I almost couldn't get out of the bath. Had to take baby steps back to my bed and just collapsed, writhing in pain and agony and a cold sweat. That's when I realized I had a horrific headache. And literally it was within, you know, half an hour of that that I vanished from this world. In senior Damn. high school, I got drunk and we were driving back to my house. I, my sister was driving, I was in the passenger seat, I had my friend in the back. We were like three minutes away from my house. We're probably doing 45. I rolled on the window and I just jump out. And my sister, she looks over and I'm gone. She stops the car and is just freaking out. She sees me contorted on the ground. She thinks like all my limbs are broken just because of the way that I'm laid out. She sees Damn. like blood trickling out of my ear. The ambulance came. My heart actually stopped beating for seven to eight minutes while I was in the ambulance. Does that mean that you were technically dead for seven to eight minutes? Yeah, that's, that's the way I look at it. Then that's when the coma came because once I got to the hospital, my brain was swelling so much because of the impact. They were forced to put me under like a medically induced coma. Mm. And at that point, it was all up for, for air. Like if my brain were to hemorrhage, I would have died on spot. Either put Damn. me in a coma or like risk me dying. It started basically November 7th, 2015. I was about to have a uh, female to male reconstructive top surgery. I get out of surgery. We do a 23 hour stay at the hospital. By Tuesday, I'm starting to get these like very painful- Wait, what'd you say female to male? So that means that they took off her breast or something? Headaches. By the end of the week, I started to- Yeah, like, I think so. Like a, a little bit of a fever. 
And then by Friday night, I just I just felt like horrible. I go to bed yeah. and I don't really wake up the next morning and my partner knows that something is like really wrong. So we go back to the same ER. We come into the ER, they put me in a wheelchair. I throw up, they intubate me. Fuck. And then I have a seizure. They gave me a sedative to calm my body down when I had the seizure, but I didn't wake up from the sedative. And by the time they gave me an MRI, they saw what they needed to see was just that my brain was covered in like lesions and swelling. In my situation, I got viral encephalitis. And I think I just wanna make clear that there's nothing about the coma that was caused by my gender affirming surgery. It was just a kind of a weird coincidence. How long were you in this coma? It started on my dad's birthday, which was November 14th. And then Damn. I woke up on the- That would suck bro. Like imagine if you had a child, like a kid and like your kid goes into a coma the day of your birthday like you can't even celebrate your birthday anymore you're just worried about so it's like how your kid is i was in a coma for a little over two weeks i was in a coma for that long but it took me a while to like come back to like full consciousness i was in coma for seven days i mean i i came back to this world on the seventh day i went in the 10th of november 2008 uh and i was gone from this world until the morning of the 16th damn I wonder if they just dream. There's like some amount of consciousness or awareness. Like you're just, you just got your eyes shut, but you're aware of the world around you when you're in your coma. Can you explain what being in a coma was actually like for you? It felt like being blackout drunk or, you know, being asleep without the dreams. Like it was just complete uh -huh. darkness. It's hard what to explain. What the fuck? I think I knew who was there. I think I felt people, but I can't explain it. It's, I wasn't really there. It's like a different space, right? Because also- I don't wanna cut them off, but is that like kind of like sleep paralysis with your eyes closed? Cause you can't move your body, but you can so hear everything? In my case, That's my crazy. brain was literally like very damaged. You know, I think it's important people understand. I would spent 54 years of my life before coma honing a very kind of conventional, modern scientific view. I worked as a neurosurgeon. I taught neurosurgery to Harvard Medical School for more than 15 years. Oh, I damn. thought I had some idea of how brain, mind, and consciousness work. I had bought in a pretty fully over decades to the conventional scientific model, which is known as physicalism, the notion that only the physical world exists. I had some <laughs> observations towards the end of the coma, what seemed to be a journey of months or years, even though it all had to fit within seven really? days. So it felt like oh, you were damn. in a coma for an extended period of time. Now, never during any part of the seven day journey did I have any kind of body sense at all, period. I was just a speck of awareness. My first awareness was in being in what I call the earthworm's eye view, a very primitive kind of subterranean realm. It was like being in dirty jello. I had a strong tactile sense of roots or blood vessels that would kind of tangle against my awareness. Kind of a microscopic level. And that's why the next phase was so astonishing. This light that came towards me and it was slowly spinning, had these fine silvery and golden tendrils off of it. And as it came towards me, I realized it had a perfect musical melody. And that was important because that whole time in the earthworm of my view had been uh, worsened by this kind of pounding, a steady monotonous bang, like someone smashing an anvil. When that slowly spinning melody came up, it led into this brilliant ultra real gateway valley. I was a speck of awareness on a butterfly among mm. millions of other butterflies. And they were Man, all- Man, he has good memory to remember that. Colors absolutely beyond the rainbow. I remember uh, witnessing below in this valley, very fertile valley, lush with light. And you can see that it was organic matter that you've seen on earth before? It was a very earth-like realm. Uh, but it was it was kind of ideal. It was like a world of ideals, of perfection. There was uh. no sign of any death or decay. There were sparkling waterfalls into crystal blue pools. And there were thousands of beings down there, all these souls dancing. I remember vividly uh, these scenes of children playing and dogs jumping and all this merriment and joy was being fueled because up above were these swooping orbs of golden spiritual beings that were leaving these sparkling trails against a blue black velvety sky. And so my first awareness of the divine, of this incredibly loving divine force of pure healing and wholeness was like a soft summer breeze that blew through the scene. And no elements of the scene changed, but everything about my comprehension of it changed. What then happened was those angelic choirs above, they were emanating chants and anthems and hymns that would just thunder through my awareness. Now it provided yet another musical portal. 
vibration, frequency, music, and a portal of light going through these angelic choirs. That led me into what I call the core, infinite inky blackness with this entire higher dimensional multiverse. And being told in that core will teach you many things. And, and to me, what it appeared like was all of these interwoven threads. And all these interwoven threads were the lives of individual souls coming in and out of incarnations, but it all goes somewhere. But the core realm was absolutely the furthest from any kind of human experience. That is absolutely fascinating to me for many. Yeah, motherfucker talks so much. <laughs> <laughs> he gave one of them great that fucking many description. Describe sounds like when people recount experiencing alien abductions. That light, that that force, that portal, a being speaking to them, feeling things but not having words to go along with them. Also, many religions depict this kind of uh, utopian world, this nirvana, where yeah. there is no pain, there is no death, there's just happiness, there's togetherness, there's joy, and that's really what you feel. And then. The third element to that, that that it reminds me of is many science fiction depictions of alternate realities, even interstellar, kind of having that, that different perspective through a different dimension uh, with kind of that fluctuating space-time realm. Absolutely. And it's amazing as people start to explore consciousness. Before we continue learning about the world of coma survivors, there's something wrong here. I had an experience that cannot have happened according to modern neuroscience. Julia, you've been in a coma for four days. All I could do is be like, a coma? I have a special announcement that I am very excited to share with you all today. We just launched an official podcast version of this series for all of you nice. who've been coming at me. And before this video continues, bro, this video is sponsored by nobody. What the fuck? In the comments <laughs> telling me, hey, Andy, I like to listen to this series in the background when I'm trying to drive. I like to listen while I'm stitching together my fursuits. They take a lot of dedication, and I need to use my eyeballs for other things. You are in luck because this series is now available streaming on all podcast streaming platforms, including Spotify and Apple Podcasts, if you'd rather listen to the audio optimized version of this series each week. And on top of this, you'll find a fully exclusive audio only episode of I Spent a Day with Gender Fluid People. For those of you who've been keeping track, we was that it earlier last year before the pandemic. I'm sorry, no disrespect. I just don't know what gender fluid person. means. It was a very different world. And it's a I'm very, have to watch that very, video. very good episode. But unfortunately, we had a mishap with the video footage and we lost it. But I am so happy that we can still release the episode in podcast form. So go now and search for the I Spent a Day with podcasts, or you can click the link down in the description below. Now, back to the world of coma survivors. He has his own sponsorship. I mean, his own ads. Do you ever have people telling you, you're like, no, you didn't experience this realm. It was just your your brain kind of like in its last, uh, last moments of what it felt, its last moments of life, just kind of having hallucinations and kind of like a defense mechanism to help you die peacefully? Absolutely what I thought when I came back to this world. Like I said, I didn't even recognize family members those first few hours, and then it all started coming back. Uh, yeah. And I realized how trashed my brain was. And as I was trying to tell my doctors about uh, the, the deep spiritual experiences, they would pat me on the back and say, well, your brain was soaked in pus. When I went through all my medical records and went through my experience, I said, there's something wrong here. I had an experience that cannot have happened according to modern neuroscience. Did you start to doubt yourself? At the beginning, in the first few weeks and month or so, I knew it was a hallucination. I knew there was no way this was real. It was way too real to be real. Would you consider yourself religious before this experience? Now, I grew up in the 60s and 70s, and like just about many of my friends of that era, I, I knew science as the pathway to truth. For the eight years before my coma, from 2000 to 2008, I didn't believe in a, uh, the power of prayer or in a loving personal God. I'd given up on all that. Basically, I'd become totally agnostic. And then my mm -hmm. coma journey, bam, you bet. It's not a question of faith. I know the reality of an infinitely loving God for us at the core of all that is. Do you feel like near-death experiences have shaped human history uh, through uh, the stories and written documents surrounding and describing religion? Yes, I would say uh, NDEs have been very important. In fact, I would say that every religious system has emerged from some kind of a, quote, NDE, near-death experience, some kind of an experience that showed, you know, the soul going through it. 
that they were much more than just a physical body. Part of what I find so fascinating is the concept of reality itself. I feel like, um, you know, through modern science and just through our interactions in our daily life, we say reality is what we can see, what we can hear, what our five senses tell us is real. And if anyone in the same room can agree, that's real. But if many people have near-death experiences and experience very similar things and many times the exact same thing independently, then doesn't that make that perception of reality also reality? Absolutely. And, and that's the important thing because more than half of indie ears will describe that reality that they experience, just like my Gateway Valley and Core Realm, as much more real than this world. Mm. And you can only kind of get that when you've been there. But it's absolutely true. And, and the way I would explain it is nor in this world, you know, my, my eyes, my ears, my brain, as we said earlier, all that is kind of restricting, confining, and limiting information. Whereas right. in that world, it's like drinking from the fire hose of pure conscious awareness. Our five senses are- Was there that one thing that people, it's like a conspiracy theory, that people say like, oh, the world we live in is not really the world we live in or like the real world, like this is just like the trial stages. And then like once we die, we actually live in the real world we're supposed to live in. Like this is just our test or yeah, like uh, uh, where you could do all the errors in the world. And then once you learn from them, you go to like the real world and actually provide instead of you know taking away some shit. I don't know. Almost those are weird ass conspiracy theories. They're pretty dope though. Our physical In body interesting and mind alive for us to survive in 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 the here and now. The past, the future don't necessarily matter. It's all about the present. So I mean, who's who's to say that there might be more beyond our five senses? Do you remember the moment when you finally came out of your coma? I had been moved to my own private room. My mom and her twin sister were there. The doctor was hovering over me and I had blood leaking out of my ear. Never a good oh, sign when you have blood leaking out of your ear. Yeah, that's... you know, like, that's what you love waking up to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I heard the doctor saying he should be fine, but we'll monitor it. So they were trying to wake me up. Like they do these things when people are in comas or unresponsive where they like come in. <laughs> wake up, wake up. <laughs> so they're literally just an annoying sibling? Exactly. The doctors were like, wake up, Julia. And they would like rub my sternum. They would like bang on me. They would like pinch my feet. And, like, so I Damn it, John, stop. I'm trying to sleep. <laughs> the six faces that I saw at the very end of my coma. That was my first awareness of coming back to this world was seeing those faces. But then I was still in this murky realm and it was only as I got close to excavation uh, that uh, I was really starting to be aware of that ICU bed. Do you remember the first thing you said when you woke up? When I got out of the coma, my partner was like, Julia, you've been in a coma for four days. And I just was like, all I could do was be like, a coma? <laughs> so the first time I saw my brother and my mother-in-law, I said, oh, this must be a real bonding experience for you. I mean, <laughs> for them, then, not like, for you. Oh my God. It was so surreal to like, just not be able to really put, put all the pieces together. What was your reaction to finding out how long you were unconscious? Wait, wait, wait. I know this is irrelevant, but what's, ah, what anime is that? Is it a silent voice? I think it is a silent voice, right? Or, or is it erased? Damn, I forgot. Hey, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's an anime where the guy, like, he he saves someone and he gets into an accident and then he stays in coma. Is it like that? Dude, I'm so mad because that was such a good show or movie, bro. Like, he gets in a coma and, like, supposedly you have to do, like, physical therapy. Like, like maybe your loved one or, like, an actual nurse has to physically help you by stretching your legs, moving your arms so your muscle won't, like, you know... Because once you don't stop using muscle, it like goes away. So Every that's where you gotta physically exercise and shit. Like, of course, one, two weeks is not that much, but like when you get in a coma for like a year, it's a different Nothing story. Nothing lined up initially. I was trying to make right. sense of all this. I could not believe I had done that. It was like, they told me I was in there for like a little over two weeks. I had like instances before where I ended up in the hospital, but it was always a night, a few hours, never two weeks. Do you know if there's any talk of pulling the plug or anything like that from any anyone who kind of like didn't have faith that you would recover? The doctors had held a conference with my family where they said in spite of very powerful intravenous antibiotics over a week on the ventilator, etc., no positive signs were there and they thought the best course of action 
was to let me go because they said they'd never seen anybody in a coma this long, bacterial malignoencephalitis involving all eight lobes of the brain and brainstem who then had a full recovery or a meaningful recovery. They estimated I was down to a 2% chance of survival by the end of that week and that's why they recommended stopping antibiotics. Life after coma. And what was the aftermath and recovery like for you after your coma? I couldn't really walk. I couldn't really grip things. My brain was like having trouble like communicating and my memory was like really bad at first. I couldn't remember like a sentence after like 15 seconds or something like that. I remember there was this one moment because they were trying to see if I could take showers on my own yet. And so that was one of the tests I had to do. I had to like take a shower and dry off completely and then have someone rank my experience. Rank it? Yeah, like so, rank it. Like, yeah. like Did like, you ever think you'd get ranked on how well you shower? <laughs> no, I didn't. You know, and I really was not ready. I was not ready for that moment. I walked out at my last <laughs> still- They sprayed them cheeks and they're like, yeah, you cleaned it. That's, That's a six so out of 10. What's up with that? You're like, I, I never <laughs> thought that my, my showering skills would be judged yeah, by quite. someone else. Did this experience change your view on life and death or did it uh, change the way that you live your life? I think it just feels a little wild to have almost died, right? It makes you right. feel differently about life and joy and honestly my health. I think immediately after the coma, I had to stop. I had to take care of myself really, really well. So to make a full recovery and have a healthier body that I can like really take around the world and not constantly feel sick. It was a, definitely a new lease on life in more than one way. Everything. I mean, it's, it's how I treat others, how I see people, how I see animals. I mean, every bit of that is now much more based in this deep sense of connected uh, spiritual existence that's all with a goal. It, it, it has a, a purpose of learning and teaching mm-hmm. and growing together for the evolution of all of consciousness. I mean, mm-hmm. my worldview has shifted 180 degrees and grown tremendously. And even though you can't remember it, do you feel like you were trying to end yourself? Like, I kind of always had like a suicidal mindset while I was drinking, especially at that point in time. I think this was just my moment of like actually doing it, you know? Did your experience in the coma change any of those thoughts that you had? It made me appreciative, so appreciative of everything. I was just so thankful and it really felt like a second chance. The coma is like what I imagined death to be. It was just empty and I wasn't in existence at all. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to like reach that place just yet, not anymore. Do you have any fear relating to falling asleep now? For the few times that I have uh, gotten drunk since the accident, that's a big fear of mine. Like, what happens if I black out and I don't come back? Mm. I, I, I shouldn't drink and I don't even want to because it's, it's terrifying. Like, this next shot could be like the life or death of me. Like, it, it's something that scares the life out of me. You know, I, f- I feel like there are a lot of people who just don't understand addiction. Like, addiction isn't really talked about. People are just like, if you don't want to do it, then don't do it. Do you think that you could explain why someone who has experienced such a horrifying event while drinking might still have drinks here and there and get drunk every once in a while, even though you know you shouldn't and maybe you don't even want to? Like you're always looking for an excuse to do it, a reason to do it. And there are like, whenever you're under like huge emotional stress or like just like upset or anything happens, you think about drinking. Like for me, it became a coping mechanism. Yeah. I started when I was so young. I started when I was 13, I'm like now 21, went through all these moments and I'm still struggling with my addiction. It's a constant battle. And sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. It stems from this place of wanting to escape something that's in the back of your mind. Maybe you, don't, maybe you can't even identify what it is, but you just want to escape the feeling that you have and it becomes that comfortable space. Especially like when you start at such a young age, it's like that's how I learned to get through like all of my insecurities, how to get through like all of my emotional problems is just drinking. Now trying to find new coping mechanisms, it's really, it's been really hard. Did being in a coma affect your job or any relationships or anything like that? So initially I assumed the scientific world was going to be very, um, you know, anti uh, everything I said about this. Yeah, did you fear your colleagues uh, in your scientific field would disown you or just completely write you off or call you crazy? Well, that's what I, I thought initially. It was one of the challenges I had in, in even making a decision to go public with uh, publishing Proof of Heaven. But I must say, I started giving talks about all this, and it was mm-hmm. in giving those talks, and I'd make DVDs, I'd send them around to friends, 
they come back to me with comments and that helped me understand especially from the scientific community i started realizing that there's a lot of work going on in science about exactly this. What was your coma and recovery experience like uh, with your country's healthcare system? Did you find that to work for you? My experience with the healthcare system couldn't be more than, oh my God, thank God for these people. My medical insurance uh, paid for everything, and that's one of the reasons why I'm a huge proponent of bringing some form of universal health care to our country, because I think Hell it's yeah, absolutely uh, abominable that people go through this kind of thing and then get bankrupted by it, and their lives destroyed financially by trying to pay back uh, the, the health care system. We absolutely, if we want to call ourselves civilized, we must have a much better health safety net for all members of society. All right, you got five seconds to shout out or promote anything you want directly in the camera. Go. EvanAlexander.com, the book Living in a Mindful Universe, SacredAcoustics.com. Make sure to come subscribe to my YouTube channel at Frank Laundry. And if you're battling addiction, please seek help. You are not alone. You can find me on Instagram at Julia Weldon, and my music is under the name Julia Weldon too. You can find. You can find me at Instagram at Gordo Nino. Uh, I want to shout out to. Uh, Myself. <laughs> so yeah, that's where I'm gonna end it, guys. Uh, I'm up. I'm gonna react to another video, but this was very entertaining. I like what that guy was saying, like how hard it is to overcome addiction. We might just react to like I don't know an addiction stories or something like that that changed someone's life because that looks that sounds pretty dope. So so yeah, if you guys want to continue watching with me, we'll go to the next video. And someone someone was talking shit to me because saying that like you post too much. I don't give a fuck, bitch. <laughs> but yeah, let's go watch another one. I'll see you guys there. Take care. Hola, niño. Wow.